Hello and welcome to About Books. Tonight we'll be meeting with Angela Preston, who's going to talk to us about her book, Opening Doors. And later on, we'll meet Peter Kennelly and David Brazendale, both local authors, who are going to talk to us about their work, about the life and buildings of Liverpool. But first, we'll meet Angela Preston, author of Opening Doors. Today I'm interviewing Angela Preston, who's written Opening Doors, which was published this year at a launch at Blackburn House. Hi, Angela, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. Well, um, I was particularly interested to read this one because it's really a narrative of transformation, isn't it? You really took your life and changed it. So would you like to share a little bit about what you thought were the real high points of that journey? Um, the real high points for me was uh, the journey I went on. You know, it took me back to when I was a child. Sometimes you don't realise how strong your memory can be mm -hmm. and all I, you know before I'd written the book sometimes the memories could overcome and you could get upset at certain memories but I actually had quite a lot of happy memories so the journey of remembering times which were really good you know growing up in a family with five sisters times were tough but we had more good memories than bad so that for me was the greatest journey uh, the the hardest part was concentrating and the discipline behind writing the book. I had to be disciplined, but, you know, I was so determined to succeed. For those people who haven't read it, just, just give, fill us in on exactly what the text talks about. Really. The, the, the book is about growing up and survival, growing, in a, growing up in a poor bracket background in Liverpool and um, just having hope in your heart that things will transpire into something good and you can be successful no matter your background. Um, I was a finance manager and worked for the same company for tw just on 25 years and I decided last year that you know there was more to life than 70 hours a week. How did it feel to hand you notice in? Oh wonderful, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> it, yeah. wonderful. It was <laughs> it was the best decision I ever made. I handed my notice in on the 8th of May last year. Wow you year. remember the date. Yes and um, <laughs> I just thought it's time to move on you know my children are now men and I thought this is time for me. I've been a mum for 20 odd years and I thought you know it's time to go out into the big wide world and succeed at what you've always wanted to do. So it's is, really your life story, isn't it? Of course it yeah. is, yeah. And but it's also about how uh, empowering women, how you can you can go out and achieve and become something that you've always dreamt of all your life. You know, does when you sit at home and you think about the hours you put into work, if you put that into something you're very passionate about. I think that too. Yeah. yeah. You've got to when you wake up in the morning it's it's about spending your life doing something that really matters to you and that helps to make the world a better place I think too. of course and if you're giving back that in your heart that gives you a nice feeling when I was working all those hours I wasn't able to provide time for charities which I can do now beforehand it was you just... got any advice for people who might like to change their own stars yes I would just say go out and do it just, just do it just take a chance I took a chance and the journey I've been on since has been unbelievable it's just the greatest feeling to have you, you know got one greatest moment uh, probably my book launch on. Um, on the 14th of August of this year to see all family and friends sitting in the crowd and just for, for the support and the encouragement I, held, I had from that crowd was unbelievable. I was interviewed exactly the same way by a life coach that I have and just the feeling of sitting there and think I have really accomplished what I set out to do. And you're doing life coaching yourself now, aren't yes, you? Yes, I do life coaching and motivational speaking. So um, for me to achieve what I did was a huge, huge for me. Would you say it's important not to avoid the idea of failure but to keep working after you fail at something. There's a section in the book where you talk about whether you're going to be an academic success, how you're going to move forward, and you, you say very specifically you're just going to be the best you can be at whatever it is you decide you're going to do. I believe we have to have failure to be a success. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Because I think that's really important. Of course. Um, when I have failed at certain tasks that I've put in front of myself, I've just sort of took a day or two to get over it, dusted myself down, and then I've put a strategy in place of what I can do moving forward. Differently? To, yes. Or sometimes just sometimes the same, the same but, but, moved, just, but add, just trying again? Just add a little bit more onto it, you know. Um, but I've always thought... If, if it doesn't work, you don't change your end goal. I believe you just change your plan, you know, and if you have to change that plan, you just take a different direction. And failure is the biggest part of success because I believe if you fail at something, you can learn from it. Every 
incident or you know everything that's happened in my life I've took lessons from it even if I have failed at something. You've had some dark times as well haven't you particularly around the death of your mum yeah and, and your reaction to that was I think something that an awful lot of people at home will share. Yes. Um, would you like to say something about how you can use grief as a positive? Yeah I, uh, my mum was um, a very inspirational woman. She had six girls. That really comes across from here. She sounds amazing. She was. She was. Um, and the time she put into ju not just the six girls, but her grandchildren also. She was the mum to 16 of us, really. Wow. Um, I bet she was busy. She was. She always <laughs> looked after all the children. And her biggest smiles was when she had all the grandchildren oh. around her. Um, so the grief at the time really did take me to a dark place where I would wake up and look for a drink and I'd go to bed and look for a drink. And in the end, uh, one day, my husband had a really bad accident um, and was disabled for life through this accident. And I woke up and thought, you know, I have got to stand up and be counted now. I have lost my mum, but would she want me to be in this place? Her belief in all six of us was that we could be and do anything, and that's what pulled me back. And having to take on the role of mum and dad, because my husband's accident was really bad. So it, it was dark, but it was also a time for reflection. So you think family is really important? Very important, because we, we did grow up very poor, but the foundation of love that we grew up with from my mum and my dad, my dad was a very strict, old-fashioned man from Liverpool, but also, you know, worked really hard and put a lot into us, and all of the determination and the discipline actually came from my dad to succeed at writing the book. Do you think it needs to be a blood family? I'm just thinking of people at home who maybe don't have any relatives, but who could find some kind of support or love or kind of motivational force from other people. Would you say that? I'd say anyone who's a role model in your right. life, you can learn from them and, you know, you can go on to be successful after looking at what they do. Um, no, it doesn't have to be a blood, relative. Be blood relative. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you doing at the moment? I actually work with a couple of charities. Um, I do life coaching and motivational speaking. I'm actually on uh, my second book at the moment. Okay, and tell us about that. That's uh, giving you the tools of how to succeed. That's called Opening Doors, The Key. Oh, fantastic. And I'm also in the process of writing a play, a comedy play with my husband. Uh, my husband's quite a funny man. So uh, we're just in the middle of doing both the play and the book and doing a lot more for charities. If you had to identify three strategies for success, what would they be? I would say plan. Plan. Be passionate about what you want to do. Care, because you can't fake that. Can no, you? passion is caring. If you yeah. if you are passionate about it, it will come across and it will show. And also um, have fun along the way because <laughs> That's nice. I have had the most wonderful fun in all of this, you know, just talking to people. And I'm doing a talk in a book club on Thursday and I can't wait to go and talk about how important it is to enjoy the journey that you're on. Because some people get focused only on the end goal, don't they? And then you miss the moments along the way. Of course, but I think if you sit back and reflect at the end of the day when you've done something big, um, you sit back and reflect on it, you can learn from that also and put something different in for the next talk that you're going to do or the next task that you're going to put in front of yourself. How do you plan? I, I sit, I, I've always written goals from okay. a very, very early age. From so around, daily goals or, uh, or longer goals? It's, than I have short-term, medium-term and long-term oh, goals. Nice. And I look at them every day. Okay. I have a vision board that I wear, you know, I look at every day. Because What's a vision board? I have all my dreams and goals on the vision board and I look at it every day. And then I have a book with my goals in. And I look at that every day. So I write down a strategy of what I'm going to do. Uh, for instance, marked in my book, I didn't have much cash. Okay. So I, I done a strategy on how to keep the exposure up on my book by um, going on local t TV, local radio, and in local newspapers. So just thinking ahead. Yes, yeah. and writing it out, writing that plan out, because it's. It, I am a very visual person. Uh -huh. So when I write something down and I look at it, I then see it in my mind's eye. So that is how I've sort of got my strategy you'd together. you'd say cling to the original goals. Don't adapt those, but adapt the strategy that you use to... Don't ever to change your goals. If that's right. your goal, don't ever change your goals. I always aim high. 
some people might say, you know, don't aim too high. But oh, I no, think you if you aim for the moon, you land amongst the stars. And that's <laughs> what I've always done, you know. And then if I do get disappointed and I don't reach the end goal, what I've set out to do, I, it makes me more determined to reach the next one. Yeah, OK, cool. Other than your mum, who else has been your biggest inspiration? Uh, my children. Oh, tell us uh, about I've them. got three sons. Uh, my eldest is 26. 20, uh, my middle son's 22 and my youngest is 20. My eldest, Christopher, lives in London. Cool. The youngest son lives in London and my middle son has just finished at university as a supply teacher. So they have been ev the reason I get up every day and I achieve because I like to teach them that you, the world is your oyster and whatever you set your mind on, you can do. You know, for 25 years I worked in, an, I suppose, a nine to five job, what turns into probably eight till ten job <laughs> maybe more some days but always in my mind I knew there was more to life and I knew I had more to offer but I wanted my children to learn from that. But that grounding that you had in the nine to five would you say that was important? Very very yeah. important the company I worked at was very good and it gave me the experience and um, it built my confidence up to go on to decide to write a book so I've not got nothing but great memories for the company and the people I worked with. Oh. Well, thanks very much for coming in to talk to us today, Angela. I wish you all the best with your future projects. And just plug this again. It's the opening doors Thank by you. Angela Preston. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We recently met with David Brazendale and Peter Kennelly at the Church of Our Lady in St Nicholas at the Liverpool Docks. Peter Kennelly is sacristan there. He has written extensively on the history of Liverpool Cathedral, having been education officer there until his retirement. David Brazendale has been involved in the Athenaeum Club here in Liverpool for many years. He's written many books about the life and history of Liverpool and the local area, including one on Georgian Liverpool. We meet with them to find out more. I'm here today at the Church of Our Lady in St Nicholas at the Liverpool Docks to meet with Peter Kennelly. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Peter is sacristan here at Our Lady in St Nick's and has written many books about Liverpool and about Liverpool Cathedral. He's here today to tell us a little bit about his life and work. Some years ago now, I, I was introduced to a, a High Court judge by the man who is now the Archbishop of Canterbury as the Cathedral historian. As it Really, I'm, I'm nothing of the sort. I usually introduce myself as a clapped out teacher. Essentially, I've spent my life teaching. And to be able to swap a lecture room and a classroom for the great space of Liverpool Cathedral was very exciting. And when I started there, I was bombarded uh, with questions. When, how, when did this happen? How do we know? And so I started to, to put together, purely from my own personal point of view, something which I called Liverpool Cathedral background, background Resource Book that no one would have wanted to read. And so what I did was to look more into myself as a kind of wandering storyteller. And out of that, eventually, came the building of Liverpool Cathedral, which was built around, the book is built around, dozens and dozens of brilliant archive photographs. And I realised before I'd gone very far, although it's called the building of Liverpool Cathedral, and of course it was about stone and woodwork and glass, it was essentially about people. And so I tried to introduce each chapter with a particular person. The very first chapter was, was the bishop who inspired the cathedral. The second one was the very, very young and inexperienced and unknown architect. Another one was a stonemason, um, Dickie Rowbottom, who worked on the cathedral for 49 years. And so it began, uh, the idea began to become more human in my mind. And of course, it was my cathedral, I say very pompously. I've lived in Liverpool since I was about 18 months old. I remember the cathedral with cranes on the top. 
I went to school at Liverpool Institute from about the age of 16. I, I attended services there. And so I felt fully part of this place. And I was trying to, to communicate in this book, not just uh, the how and the why and the when, but the whole life of the community. I realized when I was writing this, that there was very, very little in the cathedral archive about the first dean, Frederick William Dwelly, who came to the cathedral in 1924 to compose the great service of consecration. 55 years ago, the Dwelly Memorial was unveiled in Liverpool Cathedral. He spent the rest of his life there. And my next search really was for material about Dwelly. And I ended up, I didn't know where I was starting, I was just gathering material, but I ended up with a biography the story of this man's life. It has great gaps in it because very sadly, a lot of his important papers were removed from the cathedral after his retirement. They were sent to somebody in Salisbury who was going to write a biography. He died before the biography was written and his widow wouldn't communicate. But anyway, at least we got more detail about this man because his name is everywhere in the cathedral, even amongst people who were not even born when he was there. But he set the patterns for the use of this enormous great space. You know, here we are in Liverpool Parish Church, Our Lady and St. Nicholas. It's a very good worship space you have to be able to fill that gigantic space. And so my, my most recent exploit was to try to write a book which brings the first two together. The liturgical genius, the man who moved into this building. Someone said to the cathedral authorities right at the beginning, the people of Liverpool are giving you this great gift I sometimes ask myself, will you be able to use it? This man showed how Liverpool Cathedral could be used. That's where I am at the moment. Something else is on the stocks going slightly beyond Liverpool Cathedral. I want to, well, I've started writing a book called Cathedrals of the Northwest. It might end up in the bin, I don't know. David was a lecturer in lifelong learning at the Continuing Education Department of Liverpool University and has also been a teacher and has lots to tell us about life in Liverpool. As a lecturer in Continuing Education, it was my job, part of my job, to devise and teach courses. And so I had to think of something new each year. And one year I had the idea of doing something about the houses, visiting houses, national trust properties, etc., is always popular. Uh, and I thought it would be useful if people had an idea of what lay behind the house rather than just the, the pictures and the furniture. So I chose 10 houses in Lancashire that were, and when I say Lancashire, I mean proper Lancashire with. Um, the area across the, the bay included. Uh, and I picked 10 of them that were open to the public and had an important part in the history of Lancashire. Not always obvious. For instance, uh, there's a house called Brusom Hall up in the near Pendle, which was very significant in the early medieval Lancashire as one of the forest lands where land reserved for hunting by the lords of the manor and the king. And so it went on. Monasteries, the strong Catholic tradition of Lancashire, the development of the Quakers uh, at Swarthmore Hall near Ulverston, uh, and then into the draining of the Mosslands, which were tied to Rufford Old Hall, and up to 
the beginning of the Industrial Revolution with Hawlith Wood at Bolton, where uh, Samuel Crompton invented the spinning mule. Well, I gave this series of talks, and I was doing a class in Tarleton. And when I looked at the register, I was rather intimidated because it included Professor Kershaw. And one drew one's breath, but thought, well, we'll bash on. And after about three weeks, Professor Kershaw, who had a rather abrupt, he'd been a surgeon captain in the Royal Navy and had a quarter deck voice and manner, and came up to him and said, you are publishing? I don't know <laughs> who'd read it. He said, anybody would. And so I thought, well, why not? I'd always wanted to write something and never quite nerved myself to do it. And the result of a few years later, a couple of years later, was this Lancashire's Historic Halls. Uh, that's the, the first edition. It sold well, and after a few years, a second enlarged edition was ordered by the publishers. Just after that had come out, it was, we were approaching the 2008, the uh, Capital of Culture year. So I thought, well, let's do something. Now, I had fortunately inherited from my grandfather, who was a keen local historian, this little book. Doesn't look very much, I've had it rebound, but it is the first guidebook to Liverpool from 1797. I've been working on various projects. There is, uh, at the Athenaeum, where I'm chairman of the library committee, uh, a collection of 90 drawings of Liverpool in 1828, 1830. They are all of buildings and streets which have now disappeared. I don't think of all the buildings. The only one that remains is St Luke's Church. Since then, I've continued my work at the Athenaeum, and I've chosen the minute book, the first minute book of the committee, which covers the years from the foundation of the institution in 1797 until uh, 1806. So it covers the creation of the library, the creation of the other facilities there, the newsroom where the merchants of Liverpool could go and read the papers, British and foreign, get the latest news. After all, the newspapers were the information superhighway of the period. So that's in hand. It's going to be published by the Lancashire and Cheshire Record Society. And that's keeping me pretty occupied at the moment. Uh, but I expect there'll be another one afterwards. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Bout Books and we'll see you again soon.